Hey everyone, welcome back to our channel. Thank you for tuning in. My name is Joe, I'll be one of your hosts tonight. And I'm Alfred, and I'll be your co-host. And as you can see, we're doing things a bit different this time around. We're doing a podcast style webinar. And the title is, What We See Isn't Everything. So we've all heard that humans are vastly capable. We're intuitive and one of the most intellectual species. However, we have one major weakness. And that is that we rely on our five imperfect senses. Mm -hmm. But the one that we rely on the most is our vision. Our vision plays a massive role in how we perceive the environment around us. That's true. I did recently read an article that explained how our eyes function. And there was also a study done by the University of Chicago Medical Center. And in that study, they found that about 70% of people would rather lose any of the other four senses than their vision. That's crazy. Actually, our vision is more limited than we think. So we're going to go ahead and put it to the test. We're going to give you a couple seconds to write down on the live chat about what you saw. Okay, so some of you saw the illusion. Right? At first, you saw Albert Einstein. But as the image got smaller, what did you see? Marilyn Monroe. So we're going to take a look at another example. So the image we're looking at right now is a peripheral drift illusion, meaning the illusion is caused by the brain's interpretation of pattern seen outside of the eye's area of focus. Whatever part the figure is in the center of our visual field, it appears to be motionless, as indeed it is, while the parts seen in our peripheral vision appear to move. Right, so now we're going to pull up one last illusion. We just ask that you please focus on the center four dots for about 30 seconds. So as we count down, five, four, three, two, one. Now please look at the white screen for about 10 seconds and post in the comments who you see. Now you can say you finally seen Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> Not really, right? So these are optical illusions. And an optical illusion is any image that deceives the naked eye. While it appears to be one thing, it is actually something else. Yeah, so seeing isn't everything. Actually, when we even look up the, at, the, at the clear sky at night, mm -hmm. it's not every star that we can see. Roughly like about 2,000 stars is like the max that we can see, right? Exactly. So though there are so many stars in the night sky, because it's too dim to see, we cannot perceive them, right? It, for that purpose, human beings have invented certain instruments that allows us to see what is outside of our scope of vision. Just because we're like the most intellectual doesn't mean like um, we don't have a limit, right? <laughs> our sensory organs have a limit to what we can see. This is why we need like tools, right? Mm -hmm. And I think even NASA described about like a certain percentage that we can see. Exactly. NASA explained that us as human beings, we're only able to see approximately 4% of what's out there in the universe. Anything further than that, we would need certain tools. For example, we need a telescope. But if we don't know how to use that tool, the telescope properly, we cannot be able to see anything further than that 4%. Right. And just like we need those tools to identify the different stars there are in the universe and mm -hmm. stuff like that, um, we also need, like, for the believers in God, we need a spiritual tool. Now, God has gave us the Bible as a spiritual tool so that we can identify Christ who is to come in the flesh. But people always want to use like every different tool. Like you won't use a microscope to look up at the night sky, would you? No. No, it's not the right tool. What about a telescope to look at the germs on your hand? No. No, right? In the same way, only through the Bible are we able to recognize it's the only tool that we should use to recognize Christ. Right. And there's a verse that shows us about this. So we're going to use the Let's Bible. See. To testify about Christ. For example, in the book of John, chapter 5, verse 39, it says, You diligently study the scriptures because you think that by them you possess eternal life. These are the scriptures that testify about me. So Christ said the scriptures testify about himself. But at that time, they thought that only by studying the scriptures alone they can possess eternal life. 
For example, let's say you own a cookbook that allows you to make certain recipes. Though you own the cookbook, that doesn't mean that food will just appear before your eyes, right? right? You need to use the ingredients and use the instructions to be able to make the meal in the same way. Just by having the Bible on hand alone does not mean that you already have salvation. The tool has to be used correctly. The spiritual tool being the Bible, it must be used correctly. To lead to, us to the Savior. Exactly. Exactly. Because what did Jesus say? What did Jesus say that the Bible testified about? Himself. Himself. Mm -hmm. All scriptures testify to what? Christ. Christ. So the Bible leads us to recognize the Savior. So then through Jesus' example, should we use anything else? No. No, right? No other tool should we use but the Bible to recognize who Christ was. And again, we will use more verses to show about this. In the book of Luke, chapter 24, verse 27, it says, And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So here, Jesus Christ, after the resurrection, he appeared to the disciples who had lost faith at, in that moment. Then if you read the entire context, again it says, beginning with Moses and the prophets. Then Moses and the prophets referred to Jeremiah, Isaiah, right? Moses as well. These are, in other words, writers of the Old Testament. In other words, Christ used the Bible to restore their faith. He preached using the Bible to testify about himself. Yeah, and since Jesus used the scriptures, then what about the apostles then? Should be the same thing. Yeah, the apostles testified about Christ 2,000 years ago as well. So mm -hmm. let's see what they used. Let's look in the case of the Apostle Paul. Acts chapter 17, verse 2 through 3. It reads, As his custom was, Paul went into the synagogue, and on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ, he said. So then what did Paul use to explain about Jesus? He used the Bible. He used the Bible. Apostle Paul went into the synagogue and confirmed through the scriptures that Jesus was the one that was described about in the Bible. Right. So and there, what, there's another example too yeah, as well. See it. In the same book of Acts, Apostle Philip, he did the same thing to preach to a very important official at that time. It was uh, the Ethiopian eunuch. Mm. If we look in Acts chapter 8, verse 35. It says, and Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Then again, at that time, Philip, he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Then what passage of scripture was the Ethiopian eunuch reading? If you look in verse 30, it says, then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked him. So through these examples, we can see that the apostle Paul, the apostle Philip, Jesus himself, he only used the scriptures. They only use the Bible as the tool to recognize Christ. Mm -hmm. Because like we established, right, we're really limited. So we need tools to see things we cannot see. For example, if you guys hold out your hand, you don't know, you can't see it, but there's billions of germs all on your hand, right? But you can't see it. Only when you use the tool, a microscope, are you able to see the germs that are on your hand. Then only through the Bible are we able to recognize Christ, which is the spiritual tool that we can see, like, who is the one that the Bible testified about, right? Exactly. So if you think about it, 2,000 years ago, there were so many religious leaders that should have recognized Christ, right? They knew the Bible verbatim. Then why did they reject Christ? Not only did they reject Christ, but they ended up crucifying him 2,000 years ago. There must be some reason why. There's actually two reasons why they rejected Christ 2,000 years ago. One of them is because they did not truly believe in the Bible. Though they knew the Bible, they didn't truly believe in the prophecies contained in the Bible. And the second reason is because they didn't know who God was. Jesus Christ is God. If they, if they knew that Christ was God, they would have never crucified him. Mm. So we're going to see one more verse about this in the book of John, chapter 5, verse 46. It says, if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote about me. But since you do not believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Then why did the Jews not believe Christ 2,000 years ago? Ultimately, it's because they didn't believe in the Bible. So Christ said, if you believe what Moses wrote, then what did Moses write? Yeah. The it first five books of the, the Bible. Bible. Yeah. Since they didn't believe what Moses wrote, that is why they came to reject Christ 2,000 years ago. So although the religious leaders, they saw Jesus fulfilling prophecy one by one, they were the ones that came to reject the Christ, mm -hmm. right? Even though they knew the Bible well, they, they studied it, there were scribes for the Bible, they came to reject Christ who was fulfilling all prophecy before their very eyes. Let's read another verse. Let's go to John chapter 15, verse 21. 
They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. So then what does this way mean? Let's read verse 20. Remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. So why did the religious leaders and the people at that time persecute Jesus and the disciples? It was because they didn't know God, right? They didn't know Bible scripture and they didn't know God. So the religious leaders at those days, they boasted that they knew God, right? They relied on their own knowledge, right? But again, we're really limited, right? So them relying on their own knowledge is what led them to reject Christ. Mm -hmm. They already had this thought. Oh, I know God. I know God who parted the Red Sea. I know God who rained down fire from heaven. Mm -hmm. But when God came, different than what, what their senses relied on, right? They came to reject Christ. Right. Additionally, the Bible does testify that Christ will come a second time. There's a verse I want to share about this in the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 28. It says, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many, and he will appear a second time, not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Then everyone is aware that Christ will come a second time. But how can we make sure that we will accept him when he comes a second time? If we rely on our physical senses, we will come to reject Christ just as they did 2,000 years ago. We must rely on our spiritual senses right. to recognize Christ. Nowadays, there's a common misconception that when Christ comes again, that he will appear on a literal cloud. That's going to be a literal cloud that Christ will descend on. But the Bible clearly testifies that clouds have a spiritual meaning. Then what does clouds represent in the Bible? 2,000 years ago, there was a prophecy about Jesus and how Jesus would come on a cloud, right? So let's see that prophecy in the book of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. So who fulfilled this prophecy 2,000 years ago? When we refer to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, John chapter 17, verse 10, and also Luke chapter 22, verse 29, we can understand that Christ fulfilled this prophecy by receiving sovereign power, glory, and authority. So though Daniel prophesied Christ will come or the sun man will come on the clouds of the sky, how did Christ fulfill this prophecy? He was born in a very humble manner, in the flesh, through the body of Mary. So when it comes to clouds in the Bible, Clouds, we must understand this represents flesh because as Daniel prophesied the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky, Christ, he fulfilled this prophecy 2,000 years ago by being born as a human being. Actually, when we look at the Bible, the Bible referred to men always as clouds. Mm -hmm. For example, in Proverbs chapter 25, verse 14, Jude chapter 1, verse 12, and in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, clouds were always referenced or uh, likened to people. Right. So, just like the optical illusion, uh, what you saw wasn't really what it was. Mm -hmm. So when the Bible described about Jesus coming on the clouds, it wasn't literal. It wasn't literal cloud, but Christ coming in the flesh as a human being. Yeah. So through that, we can understand everything has a certain purpose, right? And when it comes to the Bible, all the words in the Bible have a certain a meaning and a purpose. So when it comes to Christ prophesied to come on the clouds of the sky, when we think about clouds in general, what is the purpose of a cloud? It, rain, it gives us water, rain, and also it hides the sunlight, right? So when it comes to the Bible prophesying that Christ will come on the clouds, what is Christ meant to give us? What is, he, what, is, what is he prophesied to give us? The water of life. In the book of John chapter 4, Christ, he said that only he can give us the water of life because that water means salvation. Then Christ is prophesied to come on the clouds because Christ is God in nature. Then just as you cannot look right at the sun or also go blind without the, the cloud being there, in the same way, we cannot fully recognize Christ with our own physical senses. Christ had to come in the flesh, in the, we can say, spiritual cloud to hide his divinity. The disciples continued to compare clouds to mankind born in the flesh, understanding that Christ fulfilled this prophecy. So when Jesus explained the prophecy about his second coming, he explained that he would also come on the clouds again. So let's go to Luke chapter 21, verse 27 through 28. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads 
because your redemption is drawing near. Yeah, so nowadays, many people, they think or they know that Christ will come a second time, right? But when it comes to Christ coming, people think that when Christ appears on the clouds of the sky, redemption will be carried out immediately. However, the Bible does not say that. The Bible says when these things begin to take place, your redemption, or we can say salvation, is drawing near, meaning it has not come yet. So it's, it's crazy that the predominant thought of human society is, mo for the most part, completely wrong. Right? Through the examples of the optical illusion, we can understand that we shouldn't always depend on our first impression or senses to give us the absolute truth. Right. In the same way, people only view the Bible from one perspective, interpreting all the verses in a literal sense. We should look at the Bible through our spiritual sense. This is why 2,000 years ago, Christ, when he spoke to people who used parables, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 34, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. He did not say anything without using a parable. Then when it comes to the cloud, how can this be an exception? Right. Then, then why did Jesus appear 2,000 years ago in the flesh? It was so that he can teach these people the way of salvation. So would it be too hard then for Christ to appear in the flesh a second time? Of course not. Jesus Christ, he explained about his second coming, coming on the clouds of the sky. Then when Christ spoke about his coming, we must understand and interpret that as being Christ coming in the flesh for the same purpose that he came 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, he came to give salvation. In the same way, by Christ saying he's coming in the clouds, he's saying that when, in the last days, he will come in the flesh to give us salvation. Yeah. The religious leaders at Jesus' first coming, actually, while they were looking up at the clouds, they missed Christ who came in secret. But Jesus prophesied that he will come a second time, right? Mm -hmm. And on a cloud as a human being. Then how is it that we can recognize him? Following the example of Jesus and the disciples, it is only through Bible scripture that we're able to recognize Christ who is to come in secret. Right. So 2,000 years ago, the religious leaders, they trusted on their physical senses rather than relying on what the Bible says, right? As we saw through the, the many verses before, they missed God's coming because they did not believe in the Bible and they did not truly know who God was. So in the same way, we should not make the same mistake because though they expected Christ to come in a very majestic manner, what if we made the same mistake in the last days? Though the Bible says he will come in the flesh, what if we still think that Christ will come like physically on the clouds of the sky? That we wouldn't be able to recognize exactly. him, right? Exactly. Right. So only through the Bible scripture are we able to recognize Christ. So thank you everyone for joining today's special podcast and we look forward to seeing you again in our next video. We hope that next time we can share with you prophecies about the second coming Christ. Thank, thank you, you and God, God bless, bless you. you.